Hello and welcome to the MBS show, episode number 15. I'm your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is Emilio Daniel. So, Emilio, how are you? Well, I'm fine. Really, really tired, by the way. Why are you tired? I went to this event called Anime Festival Asia. I even did a cosplay, which wasn't only known by two people, sadly. Who did you dress up as? Captain Jack Harkness. <laughs> picture it didn't happen. It happened, but pictures will only be posted tomorrow. Also joining us today is News Pony. Hi there. So, how are you, News Pony? Doing good. It's not been such a tough day at work, so I guess I'm pretty relaxed tonight. Okay, that's cool. And our guest for this week is the one and only Purple Tinker. So, how are you, Purple Tinker? I'm a little bit tired. I was up late last night, obviously, working on my show, but it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Well, the honor is ours, too. Before we start, we have to ask you the four important questions. And question number one is, who's your favorite pony? I have to say Twilight Sparkle. I actually drew a lot of inspiration for Purple Tinker from Twilight Sparkle, particularly her love of science. Science pony is best pony. Okay, that's a new way to put Twilight as best pony. Let's move on to the next question. What's your favorite episode? I still have to say after all this time that my go-to best episode has to be Sonic Rain Boom. It's just got a little bit of everything. It's got action. It's got humor. It's a great episode to introduce new bronies to the show. It's just, just a wonderful example of what the show can be. How did you become a fan of the show? Actually, funny story that a friend of mine, who I've recently learned in retrospect was my old friend Zorin, was on the BronyCon staff for a long time. But Zorin introduced me to a PMV, which was of a mashup of a number of songs. And that PMV so impressed me with the quality of animation of the show that I decided to finally check out what this show is that all these people are posting pictures from. I was a little bit confused as to why so many grown men were interested in it. But I figured, all right, I'll take a look at it. There has to be some reason why this show is becoming so popular. And, of course, I watched a few episodes and got hooked, which seems to be how it happens. The four-episode trap. If you don't love the show by four episodes, you're not going to love it at all. And, of course, most people do love it by four episodes. Moving on to the final question, what do your family and friends think about your love for the show? I think my family is a little bit amused by it, uh, my friends and co-workers as well. Although, of course, obviously at this point, most of my friends are from within the Brony community. But my, my co-workers and non-Brony acquaintances mostly regard it as sort of a quaint personal quirk. Let's move on to the next topic. In today's news topic, Lego, why you cancel MLP Lego? Lego Kuso recently posted an update on the MLP Lego page, stating that they are happy about the support and feedback for the project, but regrettably, they cannot go through with it. The reason for this is My Little Pony is owned by Hasbro. It would not be in the best of interest for Lego and Hasbro to proceed with the project. Links can be found in the show notes. So guys, what do you think about Lego not going through with this? Uh, I voted like 10 times per day for an entire week. It was obvious that the Lego Kuso project for the My Little Pony Legos had the tremendous support of the entire community. I think, honestly, this was unfortunately a little bit of a predictable response because I, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe that Hasbro actually created a sort of Lego competitor a while back. I forget what it's called, but if that is true... It would certainly explain why Lego wouldn't want to have any involvement with a Hasbro licensed character. It would simply be a conflict of interest. Unfortunately, the people who lose from all of this are the fans. I did some research and they were called Creo. As for now, they are just doing um, Transformers and Battleships. And that's perhaps the most unfortunate thing of all, that they've got this property that they could be using to bring out My Little Pony toys, but they aren't. And here's this effort of people trying to get Lego, who produces many, many more sets in the year, to do a set of pony toys, and they get squashed. It's unfortunate. True. It's just my opinion, but if um, Hasbro is really watching the community and notice that we want a Lego My Little Pony set, I think they would somehow be working on it right now. But we are not in the know because we don't work for them and, well, it's mostly behind the scenes stuff. Here's hoping that they are working on a Creo set. True that. I will buy the whole set. <laughs> Stop it. My wallet is screaming right now. I would like to add a little bit of something to this. I'd like to say that Hasbro has already given the Brony community a lot 
in terms of approving lots of things like uh, Trixie and uh, Lyra brushables, also the white Celesta toys. So in a way, we've got to hand it to them. They've taken notice of the fandom and they have given us something back in return. So if they can give us the Lego, that would be a plus. The point I'm trying to make is that they have given us something and they have noticed us. That's for sure. Oh, absolutely. They are starting to embrace the Bernie community. In addition to the toys you mentioned, there's also the Nightmare Moon toy. And they're doing a lot more work with Bernie conventions. And as a matter of fact, just today, news broke about an ad they placed in License Magazine, which has Rainbow Dash flying across the page, trailing Rainbow behind her. And it uses the 20% cooler phrase slash meme. And that's in a magazine for trade professionals. So uh-huh. they're, they're really starting to get behind us, and it's gratifying to see. It's interesting that you say that because somebody posted it up on Facebook, and they just only showed one part of the page. I think it's the next page to the page we're talking about. And in the bottom part of the article, our local TV station is listed as one of the TV station that is going to show My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. Very cool. It's about 50-50 really because most of the fans here are afraid that they might dub the show or sub the show. Oh, okay. So you're afraid that you might end up with essentially a poor quality subtitling or dubbing. Our subtitle's not that bad really, but it's just the dub because our dubs, um, I think most of us don't really like it. (laughs) Well, I I know what the German fans have said about the German dub of the show, so... I, I don't think any pony would want a repeat of that. I know a German fan that prefers to watch the English versions of the show. I think mostly Germans don't use English as their preferred language. Is that true? No, they don't. But this particular guy speaks English. For most Malaysians, it's sad to say that almost um, 30% of us, you, you agree guys, 30%? I would say more than 40 actually. Okay, most 40% of Malaysians don't really speak English that fluently. I would agree with that. To get the show dubbed, it would be in the best of interest of TV3 to do it because it will get more viewers on. Well, more viewers are definitely a good thing. It would certainly do a lot to spark the growth of a Bernie community in Malaysia. That's true, but I'm predicting there might be a, how I say, a segregation of fans, like the fans that like the dub and the fans that don't like the dub. So it will be some kind of civil war about ponies. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> be a backlash of sorts. <laughs> now that's an interesting thought. Yes, because most of the Malaysian MLP group members on Facebook are a bit vocal, really. A bit is what? an understatement. Drama on the internet? Come on, that never happens. True <laughs> that. I thought it only happened on TV. So okay, anyway, um, let's move on before you get to meal. Amelia, why don't you take this one? So in the next news topic, could that mouse be a brony? So anyway, recently, electro house musician Dead Mouse held a concert in Dublin. While on stage, he was spotted wearing a Fluttershy T-shirt. Can we safely assume that Dead Mouse is a brony? Links and pictures can be found in the show notes. It's not really surprising. I've actually known that Notch and Dead Mouse have been talking quite a lot recently, and it might be because of that. I mean, that's my theory. What do you guys think? Well, for me, I've got no idea because I'm not into the whole electro music scene. So, right. um, yeah, but anyway, um, for me, that's pretty interesting to have that mouse be a fan of the show. But the only question is right now, does he love the show or does he love the music from the community? That's a good question that we'll have to ask him ourselves. <laughs> oh, if I can only get him. Uh, I shall send an email and hope for the best. So, PT, what do you think? Honestly, I think there's just so much interplay between the electronic music community and the Brony community. I and mean, if you notice, a large proportion of the most popular Brony musicians are electronic musicians. So I guess it's entirely plausible that in that milieu, Dead Mouse would come into contact with, say, someone like the Living Tombstone or Alex S. and become acquainted with the community that way. True. I think it's safe to say that he may not be a fan of the show, but he is a fan of the community. The thing is, the show and the community are starting to sort of meld together. You see this all over the place, not only with things like Hasbro embracing the Brony community, but also with things like VAs and show staff chatting on Twitter and Facebook with fans. And the lines between the show and the fandom are starting to get a little bit blurrier. 
And I think the approach that the people from DHX and the voice actresses and voice actors and the show staff is taking is really a great approach. It's really making the community love them even more than they already were loved, which was a huge amount, of course. So I really applaud the fact that people who work on the show are willing to involve themselves in the fandom. It's great. So, um, Newspoon, what do you think? Um, it's all up to speculation at this point. Uh, all that we have is just a video of him wearing the Yay Fluttershy shirt. So, well, we know that he is in contact with uh, what Notch, as you said. Uh, so, yeah, maybe they had a talk. Uh, and he, he could be just doing it for fun. So we, we can't really make any assumptions based on this unless we see some sort of statement or more evidence of it, I suppose. <laughs> Maybe there won't be any evidence. Maybe he'll like to keep this mysterious. <laughs> yeah, that's the internet for you. <laughs> I'll say if he wears another pony shirt, he's a brony. Well, Dead Mouse has also been known to do quite some crazy, pub- oh, not really publicity stunts. He's really a big troll sometimes. So <laughs> that uh, Because I've seen him wear Skrillex number on public TV once, and that was crazy. And also joining us right now is Daniel Anthony. Hello, Pony. So, um, how Hello, are you? Pony. Why are you late? Oh, I'm uh, me and my choir. We're touring Penang up north in Malaysia, and we yeah, basically just finished our concert at Penang Performing Arts Center, and it was a blast. Okay, that's good. Um, so, um, Daniel, meet Purple Tinker. Hello. <laughs> so, moving on to the next news. Would you mind reading the next news? Not the slightest. In another piece of news, it would seem that My Little Pony has actually made an appearance at E3, the electronics conference, which is really great news for those who like video games and ponies. And as we all know, there are a lot of people in the pony community into video games. They had a number of My Little Pony accessories for the 3DS. They had styluses. They had 3DS covers. And what's really cute is that they were presented in the show Together with the toys, I see a picture on the front page of Equestria Daily, well, it was the front page at the time, with a Celestia standing on top of one of these 3DS covers, which is really quite cute and not something you see every day at a video game conference or an electronics conference. That's true. What do you guys think about it? Oh my god, you cannot... I, you cannot believe how happy I am right now. <laughs> the thing is, I've been wanting, I've been itching myself to get a 3DS, and now that this is announced, I am definitely getting a 3DS. I'm probably getting two, just for the heck of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, now you have pony accessories to go with your 3DS. Now no one will steal my DS at <laughs> college again. <laughs> because everything has to be ponified. Everything, yeah. no exceptions. Purple, what do you think about this? I think it's fantastic. I mean, every time I go to a video game store, I look at all the accessories, and there's always a handful of accessories outside of the typical Mario, Zelda, you know, other licensed products. But there hasn't been any G4 loving at all. There has actually been very little My Little Pony presence in the video game world at all to this point. The most recent things have been G3 games, like for the DS. Mm -hmm. And I've just been wondering, when is there going to be something for G4? And hopefully the fact that they're coming out with G4 accessories might mean that we might see a G4 game in the works, and that would be incredible. But I'm afraid of what the big companies are going to do with the product license, because we all know that how video game company think about shows for little girls. Uh. We all know that, but on the other hand, if we have the people involved in the show shepherding the project, there's the chance that it'll actually come out really good. There's always the stereotype that licensed games don't come out so good, but there are notable exceptions, so it's entirely possible that if you had the right people on the project, it could actually turn out really magical. That's true. I remember the game um, Wolverine Origins for the Xbox 360 and PS3. That one was really, really good. But for the version on the PS2, ah, that was rather disappointing. I just hope that the game, well, if there is a game that's going to be made by some professional, they'll make it to their best and don't pander to little girls. Make it smart like the show. See, I think it's inevitable that there's going to be a game. It's just a matter of when rather than if. So I think we can all agree that what we want is 
for people who respect the source material to get that license. It's going to be a little bit different, wouldn't it be? I mean, you think about it, the show is originally targeted at the little girls. So does that mean that Hasbro would have to think of a whole new different kind of game targeted at us, Bronies, specifically? I don't think that's necessarily the case, especially if they went with sort of an adventure game or a puzzle-solving or mystery-solving game, something like the Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney games. Then they could bring the same sort of writing style from the show into game format. A mystery puzzle game, that'd be fun. We can hope. I hope I'm hope. hoping for an RPG, really. <laughs> Okay, that would this... be great. I'm, I'm just a huge fan of the visual novel style of games, like the Ace Attorney games, and I think they'd be a perfect fit for this uh, for this show. So let's move on to the next topic, and in the next topic is guest time. Our guest for this week is none other than the wonderful and amazing Purple Tinker. She's the founder for BronyCon and the host for the Old Grey Mare. And not only that, she's also a fantastic artist on DeviantArt. Thanks again for coming on to the show, Purple Tinker. It's an honor. So, um, would you like to talk about what you're doing now? Sure, I'd love to. Since stepping down off of BronyCon, I've been primarily involved in organizing charitable events and in working on my show, The Old Grey Mare, which is a weekly show, usually on a Friday or a Saturday. I try to make it on a Saturday, but sometimes it has to be on a Friday. And it's sort of a unique format. For one thing, we often allow call-ins where we have a screener on staff. But besides that, the format of the show is a little bit unusual. Each week there's a different theme. It might be artists or musicians or fan fiction authors. And I assemble a collection of guests from throughout the community known for that particular subject. And I have a weekly co-host pulled also from the ranks of that subject. For example, my show last night was about fan fiction authors, and my co-host was Cupcakes from the Humble Brony Bundle Project, but he's also a fan fiction author. So I always try to get a co-host from that field. And every show, there's a charity auction, or sometimes multiple charity auctions. And usually the money goes to a charity called CARE. Uh, That's C-A-R-E dot org. But sometimes I have the charity of the donor's choice as the target of the money. And I've raised thousands of dollars so far for charity weeks, and it's really gratifying. Your show is pretty amazing, really, because from what I heard about your show, it's really interesting the way you do it live every week. Is it live? It is indeed live, which opens up the possibility for all kinds of mysterious and unexpected things to happen. And we kind of have to roll with the punches. But uh, I'd like to think we're doing a decent job so far. And trust me, um, I have to say that your show is really, really good and unique. Thank you. That's high praise. So we're nothing really. We're just a beginner with 15 episodes out. And (laughs) as you can tell, we derp a lot. There's absolutely nothing wrong with derping. It can always be fixed in post-production. Yay, post-production for the win. (laughs) So let's move on to questions. I noticed that in your DeviantArt gallery, you have a lot of art style. What is your favorite medium to work with? Well, to be honest, I'm not so much an artist as a graphic artist, if that makes any sense. I don't draw. What I do is I assemble works out of other people's works. For example, if you look at the poster that I did for Bronies Boston, which was actually a bronified version or ponified version of the Boston skyline, what I did was I essentially traced from a photograph and made vector art out of the city of Boston skyline. And that took, obviously, a lot of time, but I, I think the result was worth it. And ditto with my Trixie poster, which is probably my most well-known work. I came up with the idea while looking at an old poster for Houdini, and I said, how can I make this ponified? So I assembled it out of parts. I did all of the font work myself from scratch, essentially creating an actual true type font out of Houdini's old poster font, which was hand-drawn, of course. And I commissioned an artist to do the curly cue pattern in the background, I vectorized one of the pictures of Trixie myself. I pulled the other one from DeviantArt from someone who had vectorized that picture. And I sort of assembled it out of a large number of small parts, many of which I had to create from scratch. So I'm not so much an artist who draws, because I don't draw. I am an artist who puts together other people's works, which is sort of its own, I guess, way of doing things. That's true. I mean, um, anything to do with art is art. I mean, it doesn't really matter how you do it as long as it's done. Exactly, exactly. There's more than one way to skin a cat. So anyway, um, on to the second question. What kind of drawing application do you use for digital drawings? 
I've actually been a big partisan for many years. Actually, it's encroaching on decades now for the GIMP. And I got to admit, the user interface leaves a little bit to be desired. But it's what I've been used to since the mid or late 90s. And I guess I'm probably going to stick with it. And when I'm doing vector work, I use Inkscape, which is pretty much the GIMP's vector art cousin. Oh, cool. We had a few artists on the show, and they usually use um, Sai. Yes, Sai is the big thing. It's sort of the new hotness. And I don't think I've ever spent much time working in Sai, oddly enough. Personally, if you notice my Divin Art Gallery, um, I hope you don't. Um, I've been working with a lot of Adobe Illustrator. Illustrator is a great program. I, I personally, the only reason that I don't use Illustrator is because I just got used to the open source tools so long ago. I'm sort of stuck in the mental mode of dealing with them. So naturally, I found myself using Inkscape. But Illustrator is a very powerful tool. Moving on to the next question. While browsing through your gallery, I noticed that you had two custom pony fight sticks and one standard fight stick. Are you a fan of fighting games? And if you are, what kind of games do you play? Actually, I am a bit of a fan, specifically of the Street Fighter franchise. When I was a child, I played Street Fighter 2 when it was still a new thing back in the 90s. So lately, I've taken to Street Fighter 4, although I must admit I haven't had too much time to play it recently. Have you played Marvel vs. Capcom 3? I have played Marvel vs. Capcom 3. I'm not nearly as good at it as I am at Street Fighter 4. I, I, I find the game rather complicated and hard to follow sometimes, to be honest. Oh, really? For Marvel? I, I thought Marvel was the easy one <laughs> compared to Street Fighter. I guess it's more a matter of what you're used to. I mean, I hear people saying, for example, that they think Mac OS X is harder to use than Windows, mm. when most people say the opposite. But it's just a factor of what you grew up on, basically. Mm. Same thing with fighting games. To be honest, I'm a fighting game fan too. It's just interesting to have a, another brony fan who's interested in fighting games. Actually, I know a large number of bronies who are into fighting games. For some strange reason, Blaze Blue seems to be a big thing among a lot of bronies. Blaze Blue is a good game. I have played some of it, but I haven't really bought it yet. But well, maybe some day. If you search on DeviantArt, you'll actually find a picture of a really cute rendition of Pinkie Pie as Tal Kaka. I, I need to search for that. Some random questions. Well, what console do you have? Oh, what console don't I have? I've got a PS3, I've got a PS2, I've got a Nintendo 64, I've got a retro, well not retro duo, Retron 3, which plays Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and Genesis, although the Super Nintendo port's broken. But I also have another Super Nintendo console called the Super Boy, which is actually a portable console, but it can be plugged into the TV as well. I've, I've seen that one before. It's pretty good. It is, actually. It's, it's surprisingly well made. Where is it made, actually? Because, to my knowledge, everything is made in China. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Chinese. Okay, well, that solves the question. So anyway, uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, Media, why don't you read the next one? Okay, uh, well, in our next question, I would like to ask, I've also noticed that your show is recorded live. Is there any way for the listeners to listen to past episodes? There is, actually. As a matter of fact... The first show has been released as an MP3, and I've got a backlog of the other shows that I'm processing for release as MP3. I'm trying to clean them up as much as possible to get rid of all the ums and uhs and likes, because I'd like to have it released as a podcast on the iTunes Music Store. So the short answer is yes, you can listen to past episodes. The long answer is some of them might take me a week or so to have ready. Oh, that's cool, because, well, I really would like to hear the episode with uh, Mike, the microphone, because, well, I think I didn't listen to the whole show fully because I had stuff to do. And that show ran about three hours, right? It did run a bit long, yes. That, because, you know, that was a great show, though. Mike, the microphone, can really talk, and he's just a hysterical guy, really nice guy. And uh, it's real easy to fill time when Mike's on the show, let me tell you. I think I'll try to get him on, but honestly, <laughs> uh, I don't think so. He may come. Oh, well, I could hope. Anyway, um, next question, Amy? Next question. Today, I've listened to episode 5 of The Old Grey Mare. And it was really interesting, and I really like your guess. So do you have a favorite fan fiction? Now, that's a heck of a question. There's so much fan fiction in this community, and I haven't had time because I've been so busy to really read enough of them to give a fair answer, to be honest. So uh, I'm going to defer on that one. 
because I can't, I, I can't give this, I can't do this question justice. Well, in that case, I just want to point out, like, how many fan fictions have you read so far? I mean, in your estimate. Not nearly enough. To be honest, I've mostly read the ones that I've either written or edited or reviewed for a friend, and there have been a number of those. But running BronyCon and after that running The Old Grey Mare and preparing for conventions has had me run kind of ragged. I haven't really had much time. The thing about fan fictions is it takes a lot of time investment to read fan fictions compared to, say, looking at artwork. You look at artwork for five seconds and it's done. But some of these fan fictions can take hours. And it's difficult to find that time. It's true. I try to read most of the time, but there's a lot of good ones out there and some bad ones. You won't believe how much of a major problem this is for me in college because I'm actually forced to read other people's fan fiction <laughs> as you know, my assignment. So it kind of hurts my time schedule. Uh-huh. I can imagine. So um, the next question is... Um, what was your reaction when I invited you on as a guest on Malaysia's very first and possibly only My Little Pony Friendship is Magic podcast? Oh, I have to say I was pleasantly surprised. I didn't know, to be honest, that your show existed. But now that I do know, I'm probably going to listen to you guys. Oh, thanks. We... Sh- shadows. <laughs> oh, we tried to make ourselves popular. We got a post on EQD. Once? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Congratulations. Yeah. See, I found that the thing with EQD is uh, they've taken a policy that there are so many podcasts nowadays and so many shows of all kinds that they'll usually only include a podcast of any description in the roundup unless you get a guest from the show, in which case you get your own article. So that's basically why it's difficult to get listed on EQD because there are so many of us podcasters and broadcasters out there now. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if we can get popular by EQD, I don't mind. But I just want some recognition from my listeners. Send me an email. Just send me an email, please. We have no email this week. Well, let me let me tell you a story. The last show to interview me, the week after they interviewed me, they were interview announced that they were going to interview Peter New, the voice of Big Macintosh. Oh, cool. So it could happen. Maybe you will get a show guest and strike it big. Oh, cool. Um, was it the one where you were at your convention? At the meetup, yes. It was uh-huh. actually uh, the meetup that I had started a year ago, but I have since abdicated responsibility for. But I do attend them, and I was actually out in the hallway of the meetup venue recording my appearance on this show, so it was actually kind of interesting. Anyway, um, moving on, how did you get the idea for BronyCon? Oh, that's an interesting story, actually. It started at the first meetup of Bronies NYC, uh, that group that I was talking about just a moment ago. And that first meetup was in May of 2011. We were actually sitting in an Italian restaurant in Little Italy, and it almost felt like a very, very, very small convention. And someone bandied about the term BronyCon, like, you know, there ought to be a BronyCon. I was like, hmm, BronyCon. So I immediately started making plans, and the first BronyCon was held the next month. It was very small. There were 100 people. But we had a guest of honor. It was Cavill. That's how he pronounces his name. The creator of the Rainbow Dash Network. And there were multiple rooms. There was an artist alley. And it was basically a very small convention. People had a lot of fun. And it just exploded from there. Did you ever imagine that BronyCon would grow in such a huge scale? To be honest, no. I thought that I thought BronyCon would maybe hit a 1,000 people max. And this next one's going to hit its cap. It's going to hit its cap of 4,000. So it's just absolutely stunning how big this has become. I remember BronyCon early this year, and you were able to get the voice actor for Princess Celestia and a lot more. And that was pretty amazing. It was quite an achievement, and it, it took an awful lot of work behind the scenes. But it was all worth it. It was all worth it because it really created a magical experience for the f- able to meet these people who voice these characters that they're so fond of. What kind of advice would you give to someone that is starting their own convention? Well, the short version is don't. <laughs> uh, it, it really will drive you crazy. But if you can't be dissuaded from jumping off that cliff, I actually have a post on my DeviantArt in which I've collected some pieces of advice And some of the examples are things that people would think would be obvious but aren't. Uh, Separate your finances from the cons. 
don't make the mistake I did of having your own personal finances intertwined with the conventions. Get a good night's sleep before the convention. Again, seems obvious, but it's surprisingly difficult to do in practice. Things like that. But there's there's a larger collection of that. If you want to read that, take a look at my DeviantArt journal. It's purpletinker.deviantart.com. And I'm probably going to be expanding that, maybe even writing in, into a full essay. I'll link it in the show notes. A few members on the MLP Facebook group are going to rent a booth at this one convention. And we are trying to promote the show. Um, is there any advice that you can give us? Well, what I think you should do is focus on promotion, basically getting the word out that there is going to be a presence of My Little Pony fans at this convention you're renting the booth at. Uh, you might want to post this on local forums or hook up with members of local anime clubs and basically try to get as many people as possible in the Malaysian Brony community aware that you're going to be at this convention. And for the convention itself, you're probably going to want to get postcards printed so that people can show them off to their friends and let it grow via word of mouth. Here's another difficult question. Um, have you ever contacted Hasbro for anything or vice versa? Absolutely, I have. Interestingly enough, most of the negotiations involving the voice actors don't go through Hasbro. Hasbro just has to give approval. But most of the time in the past, I've actually had to contact either the VA's agents or the VA's themselves or DHX Media. Mm. In terms of uh, Hasbro... They basically just have to sign off on things, which can be the slowest part of the process. But most of the actual day-to-day -day involvement of a convention organizer isn't necessarily with Hasbro directly. It's with the other companies and with the VAs and the agents. We were thinking about selling our own swags there. But what I'm afraid of is licensing and not getting on Hasbro's bad side. What's your opinion on that? Well, if you're producing work based on fan art... The general policy of Hasbro has usually been to turn a blind eye to that. As a matter of fact, Hasbro has actually hosted a My Little Pony convention in their headquarters at least once, and I think possibly twice. And obviously, most of the artists there are selling swag based on fan art, and Hasbro doesn't mind. It's when you start producing things that actually compete with what Hasbro is offering or what Hasbro might potentially offer that it can become a problem. But as long as what you're producing is basically the art of, of fan creation and not pirated copies of actual Hasbro stuff, you're probably going to be fine, to be honest. I've been really considering about contacting Hasbro and the local channel that's going to show My Little Pony and asking them for support and tell them that, hey, um, we're fans, we want to promote your show. If I may just slot in the question, what's your opinion on the whole uh, plushie issue? I've actually spoken with White Dove, the creator of the plushies in question, many times in the past. And basically, what Hasbro is doing with White Dove is the minimum legally required response. The problem is, essentially, someone turned her in. Someone said, hey, she's selling these toys and she's advertising them using the copyrighted Hasbro names and blah, blah, blah. Hasbro kind of had to respond for the sake of protecting their copyright or trademark. And that's really unfortunate because I think White Dove's work is incredible. And I'm actually trying to hook her up with Hasbro so she could do official plushies with them because there's really a need for high-end plushies. But I don't think Hasbro was ill-intentioned, and I don't think that they were trying to do something draconian. It's just that they were required to do that for the sake of their trademark. They maybe overreached a little bit in the, perhaps the way they executed this, by asking DA to shut down her account. But mm -hmm. fortunately, that didn't happen. And in the end, I don't think much more is going to come of it. Actually, Hasbro didn't ask DA to shut down her account. It's mostly to ask Divan Art to tell um, White Dove to take down the information where you can buy it. Ah, okay. Perhaps I was misinformed. I'm sorry. Eh, it's no problem because um, it was a big debacle, really, about the whole issue with what was going on and people were saying that Hasbro is evil and all that stuff. I don't know. So, um, I think it was pretty well said actually. Very well said. News, why don't you handle um, Daniel's question? Sure, no problem. First question from Daniel Anthony. I really like your name. Where do you get the idea from the name of Purple Tinker? Oh, thank you. I get asked this a lot. The purple part is easy. Uh, purple's my favorite color. So that was a natural place to start. 
And as for Tinker, when I was getting involved in my little pony fandom, it was when I was getting involved also in joystick modding, which led to that rarity stick and the rainbow dash stick that you see on my deviant art. The dash stick was produced first. And so I thought, okay, I like tinkering with electronics. I like purple, purple tinker. And it was also sort of formulated a little bit on the pattern of Pinkie Pie, because her first name is a color, and her last name is, well, something other than a color. And I've actually got a full name, which most people don't know, which is Propella Jessica Tinker, which is patterned on Pink and Me and a Diane Pie. Wow, that's cool. And I think you just made Daniel's day with that name. Maybe just one follow-up question. How about that cutie mark? Oh, my cutie mark, yes. I actually had a lot of fun coming up with that. The idea was basically I wanted something simple and iconic, but not something that could be easily confused for something else. It had to incorporate a gear. I've always been big on gears. When I started the Web Union, my web hosting company, because it was union-themed, I wanted to have sort of an industrial theme, and there was a gear in the logo of that. So the gear was an obvious thing, and I wanted to add something to it because just a gear wouldn't be enough. Uh, I'm big on electronics and computers, and my OC is big on electronics and, well, steampunk electronics of the sort that might exist in Equestria. So I figured, okay, what represents electricity? Well, a lightning bolt. So I edited from a vector of Rainbow Dash's cutie mark part of her lightning bolt, basically whittling it down to a skinnier lightning bolt and overlaid it on the gear. And that was that. That's very great. Excellent. Very nice. (laughs) Thank you. Daniel's next question. Before BronyCon, have you ever organized a convention for other fandoms? No, no, I have not. I have attended a couple of conventions, but I had never organized one before. So my knowledge of how a convention was run was that of an attendee, albeit an attendee who'd been part of various organized fandoms for quite a long time. So it is correct to say that uh, BronyCon was actually your first, or your debut in uh, organizing a large-scale convention. It was, it was. Moving on to uh, Daniel's third question. If Malaysia was to have its very own brony convention and you were invited as a guest, would you come to the convention? I'd love to if I could fit it into my schedule and my budget. That's great. <laughs> we can only hope. I actually tried to look how much a ticket costs from LAX to Malaysia and, oh boy, were they expensive. Oh yes, air travel of that magnitude can get exceptionally expensive. We are essentially on the opposite ends of the world. <laughs> That is a problem when one's traveling. So anyway, uh, uh, Emilio, why don't you take um, Tash's question since she's not able to be here? Anyway, I'm taking on Tash, Tash Arena's questions, which is one of our co-hosts that could not make it today, sadly. She asks, how does it feel being a female Roni when the majority of the fandom is male? It's not that unusual, to be honest. There are a large number of female Bronies. We're a minority, but we're definitely not a tiny minority. Uh, at the last BronyCon and the BronyCon before it, for example, around a quarter of the participants were female, so it's not that weird. I mean, occasionally I'll run into sort of an old boys club sort of feel among some of the other bronies, and occasionally you'll see something a little bit sexist, but by and large, it's not that bad, honestly. Yeah, here's a funny comment that I want to make. The show is made for little girls, and boys are taking over. <laughs> I mean, how wrong is that? I think it's pretty cool, really, actually. I mean, that, that is cool. But what I'm trying to say is that the boys are stealing the girls' thing. Like, that's not nice. Making it's kind it... of like kindergarten all over again, isn't it? To my belief, the fandom essentially started over the internet. And would it be correct to say that uh, the majority of internet users are predominantly male? Uh, that actually would have been true in the past when the majority of internet users were male. But actually, at this point, the majority of internet users are female, at least in my country. I'm not sure what the demographics are like in Malaysia. But females have become really dominant on the internet. And in recent years, the old stereotype that there are no girls on the internet holds true only in fandoms, really, because fandoms still tend to be very male-oriented. But in terms of internet users in general, actually, there are more female than male. So it's mostly a fandom phenomenon that there are no girls on the internet. Really enlightening. I can add on to that, really. Uh, because there's, there's also another assumption that a lot of online gamers are boys, when in fact, after a study that I think TED.com did, they realized that most of the online gamers are actually females. Oh, 
That is interesting. Is they, they're probably just trying to hide that fact so that they don't get hit on by a bunch of creepy guys. What is your favorite thing about the fandom? My favorite thing about the fandom. Oh, there are so many. It's hard to choose. I'd have to honestly say the generosity of the fandom. How willing we are to open our hearts and our minds and our wallets to good causes. The incredible amount of support that the Brony community has given to charity is just absolutely amazing. But there are so many other great things about our community too. Not only are we generous, but also the Brony community tends to be very accepting relative to other communities. For example, people who are LGBT, and also the community tends to be a lot friendlier. Let's be honest than many other online communities. It, there are just so many great things going for the Bernie world. The, the creativity is another big thing. There's just absolutely so much art, music, animation, you name it. Any sort of creativity, you'll find it in spades in our community. But if I had to pick one, I'd have to say generosity and they're willing to contribute to charitable causes and to other good works. I have to agree. I've been ever since I joined the community, I noticed that I've been loosening up my wallet a bit to help other people out. That's the way to do it. That's that's really in the spirit of generosity. There's a little bit of rarity in all of us. I'll say. So anyway, um, next question is um, news. Why don't you handle yours? Yeah. Do you have a favorite Brony musician? Actually, I do. I have to give a shout out to the Living Tombstone. He's uh, very quickly become my go-to favorite Brony musician. Although, to be honest, it's really hard to pick one. There are so many great musicians. But yeah, if I had to pick one, it'd be Tomb. Awesome, awesome. Uh, next question is: uh, Who is your favorite Brony artist? Uh, because you're an artist. Yes. Well, remember, oh. I'm I'm more of a graphics artist. I put together art, but I don't draw. But my favorite artist, and I've actually collaborated with him multiple times in the past on making posters where he'll draw the ponies and I'll assemble the poster and do the font work and compositing, is John Joseco. <laughs> I just can't say enough good about the guy. He's incredible. Yeah, I remember a thing that Dusty made. Every time when John Joseco names come up, we have a drink. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, di- I didn't mean to get you guys all intoxicated. Oh, no problem. Uh, uh, <laughs> the question is about the writing part. Uh, what's your opinion on brony fanfiction and fanfiction in general? Well, I'll be honest. In the past, I haven't been too involved in reading fanfiction or writing fanfiction. Being into this show has been sort of an inspiration for me in that regard. I've actually written some fanfiction of my own. I've helped other people edit their fanfictions, and I've read a little bit of fanfiction as well. So I have to say my opinion is that it's a great way to expand on the canonical materials, particularly in the gulf between the seasons, between season one and two, between season two and three, and Celestia willing between seasons three and four and so on. I think it's a great way, really, to produce new material in the universe that we all love so much when there's a limited quantity of material coming out from Hasbro. That's very insightful, actually. I haven't thought of it in that way before. It's true. I agree because, to be honest, before ponies, I hate reading. <laughs> After ponies, I read a lot. Ah, Twilight Sparkle would be proud. I was gonna say you've learned a lot from Twilight Sparkle. <laughs> oh, thanks. Oh, that poster. Thanks She's gonna be proud with that poster. Recently, you were involved with the Traveling Pony Museum. Uh, what is your opinion about it? Ah, the Traveling Pony Museum is such a great effort. It was actually started by Inky Notebook, and uh, she was a BronyCon veteran, had been involved in BronyCon and Bronies NYC for a while, and it was originally going to just be a single exhibition at BronyCon, but it rapidly grew into something larger, where it would travel from convention to convention and event to event, and I think it's absolutely a wonderful effort. It's completely in keeping with the spirit of the show. The idea of sharing, basically, the joy of ponies and exposing people to pieces of artwork that they otherwise wouldn't be able to see. Not only that, but they're involved in charitable work as well. They're going to be going to the Seattle Children's Hospital on or about the weekend of Everfree Northwest and showing these ponies to sick kids and also giving those sick kids a bunch of free gifts, presumably pony-related. So it's, it's a wonderful effort. I would totally agree with that. This is basically one of the core principles or the core things that it's so amazing about the fandom. I agree. It's it's all about the generosity and trying to make other people's lives a little bit brighter. Pinkie Pie style. Exactly. So, next question is, what's your opinion on bronies doing charity work? I think the more the better. I don't think there's such a thing as too much charity. I don't think there's ever such a thing as too much generosity. 
but I've been involved in numerous charity projects myself, and I help other people promote their charitable projects. I think it's just a great way to make the world better, and it's also a great way to show people that bronies aren't just people who sit around on the internet watching ponies. We also like doing good for the world. All right. My next question is, how many seasons do you see the show going, and where do you see the fandom going in two years? Oh, that's a tough one. That's really a tough one. Well, at the moment, people are still considering whether there are going to be 13 or 26 episodes in season three. There's still a significant chance that season three will be the last. I'm personally hoping that there will be more. I'd like to see like a seven season run like the old Star Trek series. But unfortunately, I don't think it's going to make it quite that far. I think if I had to bet, I'd say four. I'd say it would go four seasons and then peter off. But the thing is, it doesn't necessarily have to run for a tremendous number of seasons to be an enduring part of the culture. Star Trek, the original Star Trek, ran for three seasons and was considered a failed show. And yet, 45 years later, now 46 years later, there are still conventions all over the world for that. So it's entirely possible that even if three is the last season, that Brony fandom will just continue to grow. And one of the most unique aspects of our fandom is... Every time there's a gap between seasons, all the naysayers come out of the woodwork and say, okay, the fandom's going to die now. And it never does. Right now we're in a gap between seasons, and yet the numbers on how many bronies there are and how many people are attending conventions just keep rising and rising. So I think, if anything, the lack of canonical material actually causes an increase in fan art and fan fiction and fan music. So where do I think the Brony community will be in two years? Well, I think we'll be having more of the same. We'll still be having conventions. We'll still be talking on the Internet. There will still be millions of people posting artwork and fan fiction and music and animations. I don't see this community going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you much for, for that, that answer. It, it's a very, very insightful uh, answer. You're welcome. Uh, Purple, here's an added question for the charity bit. Um Your show is mostly based on charity, right? The primary driving focus of the show is twofold. One is to showcase the best that the community has to offer in terms of people creating content, artists, musicians, etc. And the other is to use that exposure to drive money to charity. So it's, it's sort of a twofer. I get to get exposure to amazing artists like... For example, John Josego, the visual artist, or The Living Tombstone, the musician. But at the same time, I also get to use that to help out some very good causes. So is it primarily about charity? Yes, but it's also primarily about the community. So there's a melding, I think, of focuses where it's really two focuses in one. Have you ever wondered what happened if you couldn't get a charity on the show? Hmm, honestly, no, because there seems to be absolutely no shortage of charitable efforts in this fandom. Okay, that's good, because I've been wondering, because like it's nice to have a charity event every episode, but um, how long will it last? Because honestly, I'm thinking for my show, um, I'm having a hard time getting on guests that are local. And well, charity events, I think, are almost the same, right? <laughs> It can be difficult, yes. You know, some weeks I have to scrounge up to come up with something. But I think there's always the potential for a charity event. If there's no existing charity event, well, you can always make one. For example, if I don't have a charity item that any pony has donated to auction on a particular week, well, I can reach into my own collection and donate something from there. No, oh, that's an interesting way to look at it. Thank you, Purple. Thank you for answering our questions. I um, hope we are not too annoying. Not in the slightest. Okay, moving on to the next topic, um, email time. And like last week, we don't have any emails. What happened, guys? You used to be so good. Muffy, you used to send us emails. What happened to you? Oh, boy. If you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, contact us at show at gmail.com. You can also reach us at Twitter. Um, the MBS Show has its own Twitter page, and it's at the MBS Show, and I'm at Norman Sanzo. And I'm at King of Cuteness. What's that? I'm at Zain Piggy. Yeah, I know I wasn't on much for this show. And I can be reached at Purple Tinker with no vowels in it. That's P-R-P-L-T-N-K-R. My show, The Old Grey Mare, can be reached at graymare.org. And also, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes. Um, link will be provided in the show notes. 
So I've been Omar Sanzo. And I've been a million Daniel. And I'm Daniel Anthony. And I'm Denise Tony. And I'm Purple Tinker. We'll see you next week. See ya. Bye. 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 Life got me home, he's oh so far away I missed him more than I realize Dreams made my life got me home, he's oh so far away I had my books to read, but there was one quote that I need Hey there! our local watering hole. As you can see, we have all of the finest comforts. Uh-huh. Why don't we find out? Find out. I more than I realize. More than I, my, my, more than I, my, my, T-I-G-H-T. I'm Twilight. I more than I, my, 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 more than I, 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 my, my,